Mm -hmm. All right. Welcome to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Tim. I'll be your moderator tonight. Most of you already know the routine of the college, but uh, the format of the college is as follows. The first part we'll have our speaker will, I mean, we'll have a brief announcements period. Our speaker will speak up to an hour. We'll have our question and answer period. After our question and answer period, we will then have our rebuttal period. Where each, whoever desires will get a certain specified amount of time to speak. Generally, we uh, finish about eight o'clock, mm -hmm. about nine o'clock. But I will keep the uh, call open after we officially dismiss to see if anybody wants to talk after. Um, I also would like to uh, just give me a second here. There are two rules at the college. First one is uh, one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. And as I already said, I, it's, it does that. I can't call Charlie a schmuck. Hey. <laughs> okay. All right, Charlie. Let's get it. Let's I get it. Cool. Let's get into the announcements, okay, when you're ready. All right. It's my turn, right? Yes, it is, Charlie. Yeah, I only speak when he authorizes me to. I obey the rules. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, welcome to meeting number 3,659 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Um, first of all, we have a meet, some business items. We have both a meetup group and a Google email group. So I highly recommend you subscribe. There's instructions at the top of our main website oh, I'm sorry, on how to join either one or both of them. Not very much traffic so that you will know in advance what the upcoming programs will be. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Very quickly, April the 2nd, with the Libertarian Party, we'll be returning. Tim, you're way up, there you go. So we're gonna be discussing Libertarian Party platform. April, and then now in April, we begin our series of Earth Day speakers. We have four, one, two, three, four speakers during the during ecological issues uh, and on April the 9th, the One Earth Collective, a Chicago-based environmental organization <coughs> who has never been to the college, will be here to tell us about their various activities. On April the 16th, we're going to take a look at hydrogen, as clean energy. I know you each and one of you is for clean energy, right? Uh, anyhow, there's some developments, especially in the transportation community, for using hydrogen. The railroads are looking at it. On April the 23rd, the Illinois Green Party, to which I am proudly affiliated, will be presenting two of their candidates for the water district. Hey, this one you should all come to. And on April 30th, yours truly, Charles Paydock, will be discussing of uh, forestry, uh, restoration, preservation. And I have proof that there is a primitive species uh, residing in the forest of the United States, a relic hominid species. Uh, anyhow, we're, that should be an exciting program. Transitioning into May, our special May Day speaker Hey, now this is the national president with whom I'm acquainted uh, is speaking. This is the national secretary treasurer of the IWW. This is, she's a big shot. And so she's agreed to speak to the college. Uh, she was here once before uh, when she was just starting out and enjoyed it and wanted to come back. So that's our special May Day speaker on labor issues in the proud history of the I, of which I am a mem member in good standing. Okay, on May the 14th, the Truth Brigade will be here so that you can ascertain that do you guys need this? They offer very of a methodology <coughs> for uh, separating themselves 
separating yourselves from fake news and other things posted on the media. Um, on the um, 21st, uh, this is a new organization and they're gonna be looking at the issue of long COVID and disparities regarding healthcare policies of the pandemic. This should be an interesting program on the 21st. And rounding out on the 28th, um, this is another group that's going, they're trying to counter uh, the right-wing Trumpers who are showing up at school board meetings, trying to change the curriculum for what children are taught these days regarding the, the racial issues uh, and so forth. That should be another interesting one. Our next open dates are June 4, 11, 18, and 25. Also, I want to point out uh, two things. Our speaker tonight, Jan, has supplied some links to references. This is The link is posted as a document See it right there in the center of our main website. So you can you can look those up very easily. Just click on it and you can look up one of those matters. And one last thing, we're talking about predicting the future. Well, I spoke at the college, it's in the chat. Okay. In 2012, I made 100% accurate predictions. <laughs> I, if I look at them over, every single one of them was right and accurate and true. All right, turn it over to you, Tim. Thank okay, you. I just want to remind everybody that we do have a Texas campus involved with Dallas, and they meet at Thursdays at six o'clock. There too is it. There, there are also two meeting at Zoom, and there are also open for Thursday, March thirty first for speakers. I know. I wish I could get there. I think them. they may be taking a break for a week or two. Well, I can understand, but uh, it's uh, they also have a link to us. So, you know, um, we're always welcome. Now, before we get started, GN, is there anybody else who's got an announcement for the good of the program? Seeing none, okay, GN, the uh, floor is yours. Again, I just asked during the presentation part that we mute so that we can let GN have her full uh, we can give Gian her full attention. And Gian, don't forget to, un well, you already have unmuted. So uh, keep mine open. And, uh, you know, I've mute. I will mute from my mic. Well, anyway, just uh, start Gian and uh, we'll hopefully uh, be in good. So everybody, let's welcome Gian Lee. Okay. Thank you for having me. Um, so, my um, talk today is mainly to introduce, I need to go back, to in introduce um, a book, Super Predictor. Um, but my title is Beyond the Black and White World and the World of Yin Yang Dynamism. And uh, I hope it will be very clear by the end of my talk. Um, this is a short introduction. Um, and before I started talk, um, I like to um, have two questions for us to think about, and maybe we'll come back and to uh, talk about these um, two quotations. Um, the first one from Dao De Qing. The Tao that can be expressed is not an eternal Tao. The name that can be defined is not the unchanging name. Um, if you don't really know what Tao is, you can substitute this Tao with God or with meaning. We had a speaker who talked about meaning. Um, there's something that, um, that's significant but cannot be, um, articulated that clearly. Um, the second quotation is how you think is more important than what you think. 
What You Think by Philip Tellock, that's the author of the super forecasting. Uh, the ability to think critically and to assess the information is more important than gathering all the information um, and not knowing how to assess them. So that's the two uh, quotations. Um, I'll also introduce some other uh, scholars, psychologists, who kind of um, talk about this issue from different perspective. The first one uh, is insights from psychologist Jonathan uh, hey, Heidi. Um, and he talks about um, the way that our uh, mind wor works. Um, we are not like blank slate. We have our pre-programmed um, um, way of thinking about the world. Um, I think I have, I probably can, okay. There's a, okay. But this out, okay. Um, I'll stop. Okay, there's a video that I want to show you. Um, I think it will work. Um, so he has, he started off his TED talk by asking this, uh, he showed this, um, everyone, most of you, not if not everyone, have seen this uh, sculpture, right? So he asked the question, are you more likely to be transfixed by the beauty of the perfect human body or are you more likely to be transfixed by embarrassment? And, and he asked the question, who is more likely to be liberal? Who is more likely to be conservative? Who was more likely to have voted for Biden? Who was more likely to have voted for Trump? Just by looking at the picture and asking this question. Do you have an inkling of what he's talking about? <laughs> um, so let me show you five minutes of his uh, talk. He, I think he, he, he is very funny. Um, before that, I have to stop sharing this and then resharing the video. If it doesn't work, then I won't be able to, but I hope it works. It's a very interesting video. Um, I have to do something with my screen to be able to show the video. And yeah. it's, uh, all you got to do is just get the get the get the YouTube video up on your screen and then share yeah. screen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's on that uh, list I give to uh, Tim and Charlie, and it's on your website too. Did you want me to put it up for you? Oh, you got it, huh? No, no, I think I got it. Let me try, try again. Um, okay. Here. Can you see? Yeah, we can see it now. Just go ahead and hit the play button and we should be all set. Okay. It's long. I'm not going to show the whole thing. It's 18 minutes. I'll show for the five minutes. You can't buy love uh, 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 or happiness, uh, but you can invest in it with T. Rowe Price. I have to... Uh, Suppose that two American friends are traveling together in Italy. They go to see Michelangelo's David. And when they finally come face to face with the statue, they both freeze dead in their tracks. The first guy, we'll call him Adam, is transfixed by the beauty of the perfect human form. The second guy, we'll call him Bill, is transfixed by embarrassment at staring at the thing there in the, in the center. So here's my question for you. Which one of these two guys was more likely to have voted for George Bush, which for Al Gore? Uh. I don't need to show a hands because we all have the same political stereotypes. We all know that it's, uh, that it's Bill. Um, and in this case, the stereotype corresponds to reality. It really is a fact that liberals are much higher than conservatives on a major personality trait called openness to experience. People who are high on openness to experience just crave novelty, variety, diversity, new ideas, travel. People low on it like things that are familiar, that are, that are uh, safe and dependable. If you know about this trait, you can understand a lot of puzzles about human behavior. You can understand why artists are so different from accountants. Uh, you can actually predict uh, what kinds of books they like to read, what kinds of places they like to travel to, and what kinds of food they like to eat. Once you understand this trait, you can understand why anybody would eat at Applebee's, but not anybody that you know. <laughs> okay. 
This trade also tells us a lot about politics. The, the main researcher of this trade, Robert McRae, says that open individuals have an affinity for liberal, progressive, left-wing political views. They like a society which is open and changing, whereas closed individuals prefer conservative, traditional, right-wing views. This trade also tells us a lot about the kinds of groups people join. So here's a description of a group I found on the web. What kinds of people would join a global community welcoming people from every discipline and culture who seek a deeper understanding of the world and who hope to turn that understanding into a better future for us all? This is from some guy named Ted. Uh. Well, let's see now. If openness predicts who becomes liberal and openness predicts who becomes a Tedster, then might we predict that most Tedsters are liberal? Let's find out. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand uh, whether you are liberal, left of center on social issues we're talking about primarily, uh, or conservative. And I'll give a third option because I know there are a number of libertarians in the audience. So right now, please raise your hand down in the simulcast rooms too. Let's you know, let everybody see who's here. Please raise your hand if you would say that you are liberal or left of center. Please raise your hand high right now. Okay. Please raise your hand if you'd say you're libertarian. Okay, about a do uh, two dozen. And please raise your hand if you say you are right of center or conservative. Two, three, four, five, about eight or 10. Okay, this is a bit of a problem because if our goal is to understand the world, to seek a deeper understanding of the world, our general lack of moral diversity here is gonna make it harder. Because when people all share values, when people all share morals, they become a team. And once you engage the psychology of teams, it shuts down open-minded thinking. <clears throat> um, we, uh, when the liberal team loses, as it did in 2004 and as it almost did in 2000, we comfort ourselves. We try to explain why half of America voted uh, for the other team. Uh, we think they must be blinded by religion uh, or by simple stupidity. <laughs> So, so if you think, if you think that half of America votes Republican because they are blinded in this way, then my message to you is that you're trapped in a moral matrix, in a particular moral matrix. And by the matrix, I mean literally the matrix like the movie, The Matrix. Um, but I'm here today to give you a choice. You can either take the blue pill and stick to your comforting delusions, or you can take the red pill, learn some moral psychology and step outside the moral matrix. Now, because I know, oh. okay, I assume that answers my question. I was going to ask you which one you pick, but no need. You're all high in openness to experience. And besides, it looks like it might even taste good and you're all uh, epicures. So anyway, let's go with the red pill. Let's take, let's study some moral psychology and see where it takes us. Let's start at the beginning. What is morality and where does it come from? The worst idea in all of psychology is the idea that the mind is a blank slate at birth. Developmental psychology has shown that kids come into the world already knowing so much about the physical and social worlds and programmed to make it uh, really easy for them to learn certain things and hard to learn others. The best definition of innateness I've ever seen, this just clarifies so many things for me, is from uh, the brain scientist Gary Marcus. He says, the initial organization of the brain does not depend that much on experience. Nature provides a first draft, which experience then revises. Built in doesn't mean unmalleable, it means organized in advance of experience. Okay, so what's on the first draft of the moral mind? To find out, um, my, my colleague Craig Joseph and I read through the literature on anthropology, on cultural variation and morality, and also on evolutionary psychology. Looking for matches, what are the sorts of things that people talk about across disciplines, that you find across cultures, and even across species? We found five, five best matches, which we call the, found, the five foundations of morality. Here. The first one is harm care. I have to, to stop to stop here and uh, to reshare of my PowerPoint. Otherwise, well, it's a very interesting uh, talk. That's why um, I have provided a li list. Now I need to get this uh, window. Uh, not sharing, I, am I sharing? I'm not sharing, right? I need to get this bigger so I can share. A window. Uh, Thank you sharing, right? We see the top of a computer. Uh, can you see my uh, PowerPoint? No, oh, and we can't. You want to you want to stop sharing yeah. and then go to your PowerPoint. And then we. Am I now sharing or not sharing? 
No, you're sharing your screen right now. I'm sharing my but screen. But the only thing we're seeing is the uh, top of your screen. What my recommendation would be would be to unshare. Yeah. I, I, then, I, I, I'll tell you what. I'm going to. Okay, unshare. I'll stop share. Okay, I'll stop share and then share again. Go to your PowerPoint first. Yeah. Uh, now. Yeah, that's the PowerPoint now. Mm -hmm. Can you see my PowerPoint now? Yes. yes. Uh -huh. How come I don't see the same screen as you see? Well, um, go to your Zoom app. We, we can see it now. You can see my, my PowerPoint? Yes, we can. I don't. Uh, go to your Zoom screen. Go to my, let me, now you can't. Now I'm going to. Full screen on Zoom. Full screen on Zoom. Zoom. You see it now? I'm not on full screen for some reason. I only see a small screen. Okay. Sometimes you have to go to your Zoom icon and yeah. there will be a, there'll be a, some options in there. I have only like a, a small screen of like this. Like about a postage stamp size, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you did was you accidentally minimized your Zoom. Yeah, I probably- And you want to maximize your Zoom on it. So now you cannot see, right? No, Let we can't see. see the screen. I'll, oh. I'll do full screen and I'll share. I'll come back. I'll, sh I'll share. Uh, okay, can you see it now? I see the screen. I don't see my my own uh, PowerPoint. Uh, well, just go to go well, to your. Uh, Go to your okay. Go to your PowerPoint page and then keep talking. I think that'll okay. be okay. 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 Um, start. Uh, you. I, I, so you you do you see the moral roots of liberal and yes, conservative? We do. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see if I can go to next page. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll just talk uh, when I. I with the PowerPoint. So okay. he, he uh, had this, uh, I, I stopped at this quotation, but I thought this quotation is very um, informative. So I typed this out. The initial organization of brain does not depend that much on experience. Nature provides the first draft, which experience then revises. Beauty doesn't mean unmalleable. It means organizing events of experiences um, by Gary Marcus, a brain scientist. Um, it, it means we, each individual uh, was born, is born um, with some kind of, like, just say, personality. If you have kids, if you have more than, if you have two children, uh, if you have taught in school, if you have even like twins, they have different personalities. Even if parents who treat two kids the same way, they will have different uh, personalities, like just in terms, say, introvert, extrovert. It doesn't mean good or bad. It just means they are different. That's what they they are saying, okay, so so that the first few minutes of that psychologist talk to show you that uh, people will react to a sculpture or painting in a different way. It could be something by their personality, by birth, or can be by experience. Of course, it's hard to say, uh, to what extent is personality, to what extent is experience. Uh, nowadays, probably I would think um, most psychologists, anthropologists will recognize both play a role. No, absolutely not. Uh, one full at a time, Charlie. So you can, you, can, you can stop, you can uh, use your rebuttal time. Okay, so be patient and listen. Um, I know what you think uh, right now. I'm just saying this is actually a consensus of most um, 
uh, psychologists that uh, we are not born in a blank slate, slate. But that's just only very small part. Okay. Um, at, so this is actually, um, um, I also put three lessons acknowledging the built in biases, a legacy from human evolution, awareness of ability for change and adaptability, uh, understanding before judging and a finger pointing. Um, even if the even if the way that we think um, may be different. Terrible presentation, uh, terrible today. Uh, it's really Lana, terrible. No, it's Lana, not only my opinion. Lana, it's disgusting. It's not well, only what, my what, opinion. We'll give your opinion after the, after the show. Kim, it's not should, only my opinion. Kim, you should mute everyone. <laughs> so, I, 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 I am. No, you can Lana. mute. You know what? Nobody needs you here today. Lana, Lana let's, okay. It's what terrible. personality is she born with? Okay. Okay. Not my problem. It's well, there, problem. there will be time for question and answers, okay? Um, right. This, so just be patient. Um, um, there is like uh, evolutionary um, and, and, evidence and. of yeah. how um, humanity as a whole need people who have different, um, let's say personalities, different aptitudes. Um, some people may be quick to spot danger and some people are are uh, more reflective. Um, in fact, one of the best books I read is called HSP, um, Highly Sensitive Person. And some people are wired to be more sensitive. Sensitivity in itself is a neutral trait. Um, it, it can work in different ways. And the psychology psychologist um, Elin Aaron said, um, the highly sensitive person constitute about 20% of population. And that's something that the person was born with and the brain was wired to be more sensitive to the stimuli from the outside. And that's kind of a side story of how uh, um, um, the way that people think uh, personality wise, as not a hundred percent from experience, and uh, it is necessary to have a different um, aptitudes for humanity as a whole to survive and to thrive. So the um, uh, this is a continuation from this psychologist. He listed five moral values that form the basis of our political choices, whether we are left, right, or center. Um, is this the same talk? I... So the, f I'll show five, I think, I show, I think that it's probably a different one. Um, slide show you if I, so, I need to make it as a slideshow so it's um, going. Play uh, from current, uh, play from, play from current oh, slide, Gianna, right yeah. there. And you just yeah. use your space bar to advance. Yeah. And then I can, uh, um, I think that's, uh, if I show you. Just use your space bar to advance, okay, Gianna? And that, that, should, that should be uh, good for you. Okay. So he identified five, um, five foundations of morality that's across culture. Um, the first one is harm and a care. The second one is fairness and a reciprocity. And the third one is in-group loyalty. And uh, the fourth one is authority and respect. And last one is purity and sanctity. And he says, no matter which culture, these um, are the five kind of uh, 
foundation of morality. The left, um, the left or uh, left and center, um, they usually um, pay more attention to the first two, harm and care, fa fairness and reciprocity, uh, to, uh, to be fair to everyone, to take care of the weak is a top priority for the more liberal-minded individuals. Whereas the conservatives, they, um, they also care about the first two, but they also care about in-group loyalty. Um, my tribe, uh, most important tribe, right? Um, and authority and respect, uh, law and order, important. Purity and sanctity, um, something that's um, absolutely true. Um, religion, um, as you know, the conservatives, they tend to be more uh, either fundamentalists or just like uh, people who believe, firmly believe in one kind of religion are more likely to be conservatives. And for, I'm not saying good or bad, and, and the author didn't say good or bad. First, we need to understand before judgment, and that's the goal. Uh, and this is not only in the United States, the psychologists also use this to uh, test people from other countries, including uh, Canada, including Europe, including East Asia, including um, Middle East, uh, and it, the result is fairly consistent that liberals in different societies, even the content might be a little bit different because of cultures, but in general, it's, uh, it's consistent. Uh, liberals pr prioritize openness and flexibility, and a conservatives prefer order and a certainty, and you hear law and order a lot from our country, right? Um, oh, this is a psychologist that, that I think I can click and you can watch uh, eight minutes, uh, eight or nine minutes uh, TED talk, and she is very articulate. And I like her a lot because she is saying, uh, <laughs> they, although they are different, doesn't mean that you cannot like the two different kinds. You, you, you can still like them uh, in a different way, but you still like appreciate them and like them. And this lady, um, she is a social, political and social uh, psychologist. And she um, had husband one and husband two, and they two are very different. And she appreciated them both, both. So not at the same time as one and the other. So uh, I, I really enjoyed that. And I want to show you that video. Um, let's see, usually this would nine minutes. Well, it will probably, you will, I, I, I think it, it will just take more time. Um, so I'll talk about this and I hope you will watch it yourself. I'll talk more about this. So her uh, first husband um, was a, a liberal and he, they met in a um, open mic. They met um, like in a, 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 not debate, but, but like a social um, occasion that people uh, give talks. And, um, and he, uh, they had a baby. And then after two or three years, the first husband died. Um, and then um, she met the second one, uh, second husband, who is conservative. He, he, he was a criminal um, lawyer, attorney. So his personality, the first one is kind of like an artist. So, you know, artists are more likely to be liberal and a criminal uh, attorney is more likely, not 100%, but just more likely to be uh, conservative and to look out for danger. 
um, pay more attention to um, loyalty and justice, things like that. And she said, they are very different, but they, they are both decent people. They're both decent people and good husbands. So uh, she says like the difference shouldn't be the reason to divide us. Actually, they can be complementary. Uh, the media exploit the differences and make people kind of uh, see the conflict as something bad instead of something that can be complementary. So that's what uh, my second point is. Uh, if you look at yin and yang, society needs both. You, if you look at yin and yang, day and night, man or woman, it's not one is superior to the other. They are different, but we need them both. Um, now I'll come to the main uh, part of this book, Super Forecasting, How to Predict the Future uh, by Philip Tadlock. Um, he, uh, he is also a psychologist and uh, um, he also taught in Wharton College like business um, and political scientist. He has a lot of researches and experiences. Um, he conducted a, a, a research um, with actually, one of the researchers he collaborated with CIA and he, uh, he noticed that people uh, use very vague terms um, some things likely to happen, some things um, could ha happen, but it's not uh, precise. So he organized a, um, a tournament, forecasting tournament. Um, and this actually um, predict the tournament was between 2011 and 2015, but now um, there's an open uh, project that you can participate. They will predict uh, on specific um, events, let's say uh, Russian Ukraine um, conflict now, uh, war invasion, uh, whatever the term you, you may use, but he is not like doing the judgment. He is saying, if you can predict with, uh, well, the prediction scientifically has to be probability. No one knows 100%. So you will predict like 80% it will end in three months, uh, 50%, 50% is no good. It's just not saying anything significant. Um, say at least 60% it will end in 10 months. So he has questions and he has um, a very uh, specific time and specific topic for people to make prediction. And then you will come back and see to what extent your prediction is, is true, true. So he, one of this project he did was with CIA and you would think like the CIA uh, intelligence officers, they can see internal document uh, where, whereas he has his own team, super predictors, um, they don't even, they, they couldn't see the uh, special internal documents, but his team uh, beat CIA by 30%. So then he wrote this book because, well, his team did better, right? So why does his team do better? Do they have high IQ? Do they have more data and information? Um, actually, he, he, he said like, well, they, the answer is not really that they have higher IQ, neither higher IQ nor more data information, but the way that people think, some people just have this 
good evaluation, good um, logical way of thinking that can beat um, CIA officers who can view the internal documents. So that's something that interesting that I thought like we can learn something about it. So he said, the story begins with hedgehogs and fox. Let me see if I have hedgehogs. Um, and that uh, there is an essay, um, the hedgehog, the hedgehog and a fox an essay by a philosopher, um, some East Berlin in published in 1953. And I, they basically says, that's just a metaphor. A fox knows many things, but hedgehog knows one big thing. Um, hedgehogs view the world through the lens of single defining idea. Um, and he kind of like made a list of people who have this kind of hedgehogs um, view like Plato, Hegel, Marx, and some CIA specialists. Whereas foxes, they draw on a wide variety of experiences and for whom the world cannot be boiled down to a single idea like Aristotle, Shakespeare, Pushkin, James Joyce. Um, which group do you think make better predictions? Hedgehogs or foxes? Oh, I want you to. <laughs> are, are you, are you more likely to be a hedgehog or fox? The answer is fox. Foxes mm -hmm. make better predictions because they draw uh, information from a wide variety of experiences. Um, because you need different sources of information and data. If you only look at the world through, through one lens, single lens, um, you are more likely to have a more narrow and biased view. Um, super forecasting in a nutshell. So who are the super forecasters? He said, it is a learned skill. We, we can learn to be a better predictor. Um, of all the population, probably only 2% are super forecasters. Starting point is to have a healthy skepticism. skepticism. Uh, super, super teams. So you have also individuals and teams. The teams composed of diverse people with different perspectives, have more information to go out. So nowadays, um, if you want your, your team to be more creative, to be more problem sol solving skills, it's better to have people with more diverse backgrounds than the same back backgrounds. Um, the philosophical outlook is to be cautious, humble, non-deterministic. That's the fox. Thinking style, open-minded, intelligent, curious, reflective, numerate. Numerate means you need to be good in math, not necessarily like advanced math, but at least to think in terms of being probability, prob instead of yes, no, maybe. If if your thinking is yes, no, maybe, it's not very accurate. Many things, things that happen in the future is most likely to be probable. If you can consistently make prediction at least 70%, 60% correct, you are already on a winning team, even like, when we forecast the weather, most time it's not 100% tomorrow is going to rain or shine. Most time it's 
maybe 80%, 90%, sometimes maybe 100%, but that's kind of rare. So the ability to think in prob probabilistic um, way is better than thinking in a yes, no, maybe. So that's my, the, the next point is um, pragmatic, analytical, uh, dragonfly eye, probabilistic, thoughtful, updaters, intuitive psychologist. So uh, thoughtful updaters. So if things change, new information come, it's important to revise your old thinking. If you only think in one way and you don't change the way you think, you probably uh, would be a good super forecasting. So super forecasting, they always uh, use the updated information and revise their opinions. Um, their work ethic, growth mindset, growth mindset, uh, growth mindset, uh, grit. So you, uh, it, it's consistent in the sense that you um, don't stop at your starting point. You change when you have new information. So you're curious and you change with the information you, you get. So this is um, kind of a another summary of what I have already said. said. Um, healthy skepticism, go beyond the first instinct. Yes, no, maybe. You need to think probabilistically, not certainty. Um, how is more important to super forecasters than why? When, when some bad things happen, instead of asking why me, why, why me so unfortunate, but you need to think how things happen that lead to this result. Um, break the question down into smaller components. Look closely at all your assumptions, consider the outsider view, taking in all the information with your dragonfly eyes. I think dragonfly eyes means your eyes can see not only front, but also uh, sideways, uh, probably back too, in different perspectives. Predict predictions should be updated once there's more information. So this, there is this good judgment project. Um, I can also copy and paste all the links to the um, chat. It's also on the website. Um, so if you think, um, if you want to try out how accurate your uh, understanding and prediction of the world affairs will be. Uh, you can you can also uh, go to the website and participate. And this is the website. Uh, it's called the Good Judgment Project. Um, and there's a uh, Wikipedia explanation of this project. And there is a website. Once you register, there are a lot of questions. Uh, once you answer all the questions, you will be on that um, group of people who want to test. Welcome to Good Judgment um, Project. So uh, what I have presented actually is not really my view. I'm just introducing you um, some uh, psychologists um, new uh, in the book. Uh, here is some of my personal reflections and why I choose the topic beyond a black and white world, entering a world of Indian dynamism. So first thing about um, this um, Inyang um, picture, well, <laughs> actually, as you can see, I. Uh, 
I copy and paste from the website these these two pictures. I didn't make make them, but this is kind of fairly uh, consensus. Um, so if you look at this, um, in is night, dark, cold, negative. But negative doesn't mean like bad. It's like electricity. You have positive and negative. It doesn't mean negative is bad, right? But a lot of people kind of think, oh, negative must be bad. Uh, actually, passive as well. Passive doesn't mean, mean bad. Uh, there's active. It's just uh, two, we say the, the coins, the two sides of a coin. You have to have one to have other. So nothing about one side is good or bad. Um, but usually like in, in Taoism, these are kind of qualities um, related to in uh, uh, female, solid, liver, heart, spleen, lungs, kidney. Um, there's a lot of things going on here. Um, young is day, light, warm, positive, active, male, hollow, gallbladder, small, intense, thin stomach, large. But these actually like the, the organs that um, associate with yin yang. I'm not going to talk about this. I don't know too much about it, but I can tell you the Chinese medicine doctors, TCM, they actually use, they are still using this system in diagnosing um, diseases. Okay, I, I don't know how they do it, but this actually, the doctors still use this system um, as, as um, Chinese medicine um, theory. I, I don't really know too much about it, so don't ask me about that. Um, so that, that's yin yang cycle. Um, you can also think the easier way to think about yin yang dynamism is to think as day and night. So the day is the light part and a uh, night is uh, evening, night, night. But day and night, they are always like in a transitioning. You have uh, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, right? So you cannot say which time of day is best. Maybe you feel more awake, but it's just, part of the na nature, it's they change um, from one stage to another stage. They are not static. They always change. That's the, they are complementary. You, you need to have day and night. You need to have male and female. You need to have negative and positive. So they are not inherently good or bad. The, you can only say if it's like out of balance, it might disturb your health, it might disturb the harmony of the world. So the two elements is kind of um, um, changing and it need to be balanced instead of um, going extremes. So this actually also, <laughs> I, Copied from uh, a website. Order and chaos constitutes the stage. So that's another uh, way of ordering yin and yang. Yang uh, is order, masculine, day, the no authoritarianism, <laughs> human fascism. Oh. Uh, in chaos, femininity, night, unknown, decadent, nihilism. Um, it's just one way of interpretation. I don't necessarily say it's 100% correct, but it's pretty much um, people who, who, who are familiar with yin and yang, most of them probably will, will identify these elements. And I was thinking by looking at this, I, again, I didn't make this, but I can see the logic in this. So if you look at young, actually it's more, if, if we uh, make a uh, kind of crude analogy of Republicans and Democrats, uh, liberals and conservatives, um, I can see the conservatives are more like in a young category and the liberals kind of more in the 
um, in the in category, but it's not like anything set in stone. Um, so I also saw this on the uh, on a website, um, and they say that someone um, posted this picture in South China Morning uh, Post, uh, and that's also Hong Hong Hai must be a person of Chinese descent. Um, so according to this person, um, the United States is more of young and China is more of in quality. So if I show you this, why it is so uh, young, um, United States, the value system is more of freedom, rights. When we talk of freedom and rights, we usually focus more on individual, uh, personal, um, and NATO military alliance. This is a young. And in is more harmony. And when we talk about harmony and responsibility, it's we are talking about group. You cannot have harmony without a group, right? So it's more collective. And responsibility is mutual. Uh, and, and, and I put down here, the last two, three columns I put myself, one belt, one, one road is an economic network. It's not necessarily like only one is superior to the other, but as I've highlighted, there's a yin and a yang. You need to have a balance. You need to have both yin and a yang. You need to have both freedom, individual freedom and group harmony, uh, personal rights, and a responsibility. Um, I, I cannot go, go. I think I have more pages, but now I cannot go. OK. So we have, can you still see my pom pom? Okay, so I. So yes, this. You can, we can still see your screen. You can still see, right? So yes, here is a summary of the points. Um, summary of the points I. Um, I have made for this presentation, uh, developing super forecasters analytical skills. We need to have healthy skepticism, a sense of humility, open-mindedness, analytical skills, talking to people who hold different views from you, from you with an open mind, seeking understanding before making judgment, seeking collaboration over confrontation, practice compassion over self-righteousness. Beyond black and white mentality, entering in young dynamism. When, um, when we have arguments, uh, sometimes at um, college of complexes, it, I see one of the reasons that people enter into arguments is because they are seeing things in black and white and not uh, seeking understanding before making judgment and, a bit, and not able to see that uh, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes um, different views can be uh, complementary, can be dynamic, not all the time, I, I would say. No. So that's the two, um, two quotations I started off and um, us to think about, and this is a list, um, and we didn't have time. I'll copy and I'll put in the chat room. I think that's all of my presentation. Now, we are, I'm open to questions. Okay, Gianna, it's now question time. You know, a, a lot of you guys just saw my cat. 
would you consider a cat a yin or a yang? <laughs> I, I think uh, compared with a dog, cat is more yin. <laughs> and so dogs are more yang. And so we both need cats. So. We need both cats and dogs then, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> your, speech, your speech was so aggravating and so disgusting. And it's not only my opinion. Okay. Okay. Judge. Well, in there. All right. Now I got a question thing. It's Janice Kinsler, Charles Paydock, and Margaret Gillette. So Janice, go ahead first and uh, with your question. Mm -hmm. I have a real easy question. Would uh, Jean, would Jean please put the link to um, something she told us we can look up? Yeah. Um, let me see. I just, I I just put them. I, I just. I just put them in the chat room and it's also on a college. Oh, is that you who put all these links yes. there? Yes, yes. yes. Oh. It's okay. Also on a college website. Thank you. Is, is that all you needed to ask, uh, Janice, or did you want you. to ask another question? Okay, I'm going to lower uh, it. Yeah, right now, yes. Okay, you can always yeah, come back gonna... later. All right, Charlie, you're next. I'm going to lower my uh, hand as soon as I, I, I did find it already. I did how to do that. Janice, I oh, did it. Already. I'm sorry. <laughs> I did it again, so don't worry. Yeah, All right, Charlie, it. go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Jan, if people are born with a personality, I guess some people are born to be criminals. Now, there, there's a difference between um, a personality and the content of the behavior. So the personality-wise, like introvert, extrovert, uh, highly sensitive, these are neutral traits. The content is something that uh, you fit in more like by life experiences. But some people um, have a propensity for some actions, but doesn't mean that the content is born with. It's only the personality is born with. Some people um, will um, feel so embarrassed. Some people will not feel embarrassed um, by what they say. That's a personality. Uh, but personality also doesn't mean it's not changing. It's malleable. That means that even though that, that you uh, are born with certain personality, it also can be uh, modified and changed in your lifetime. But it doesn't mean that um, that we are all born, born the same, exactly same. So if the mother says, well, my son is in jail right now, but that's the way he was born? No, you, you still are not distinguishing the uh, the personality by itself. Let's just say a very simple thing like introvert, extrovert, highly sensitive versus someone who is not sensitive. These are personality traits, which which actually they are neutral, but the content is a different thing. But content. When the content fits into that trait, it might have a different, um, it might manifest itself differently. But it doesn't mean someone is born as a criminal. No, your, your personality by itself is neutral. Some people were born to follow the rules and others were not. It's you are thinking in black and white terms. And my talk well, is that we have to go beyond black and white. There is a wide range. There is a wide range um, of pro probabilities. So, um, <laughs> all right, so I, I, is that it, Charlie? Is, is that it? Charlie, don't I don't know what kind of answer I got, but <laughs> I'll turn it over to somebody else. 
Il- yeah, Ilana, but... I'll get you after Charlie and Margaret. I don't go. want even I even don't want to waste my energy to talk to her because she's disgusting. Well, no, no. Uh, so, Ilana, we'll get you after oh, Margaret. Don't let her speak no more. Uh, 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 Ilana, you're gonna be after Mark after Margaret, and then uh, it'll be you and oh, then Ellen Corley. No, I don't want to. I don't want to waste my. You my, uh, well then, like either leave the either work. leave the college or wait your turn to ask a question. Jesus. Okay. Uh, oh, Margaret, good. please go next. Oh, I get, this is so interesting, Jan. And it, it, tell me a little bit more. And Charlie was kind of picking up on this too. A child could be born with, um, could, is it possible that the child could be born uh, with a rather loving, extroverted personality? Uh, and if so, why, what went on in the womb or conception to create that versus the person who is very, say, uh, uh, anxious about self, not extending self at all, <clears throat> are these traits or whatever whatever this is with which we are born, uh, does that start at conception? Does it start in the womb, in the relationship of the mother to the child, and maybe even what's going on exteriorly with the mother? This is a fascinating idea that we're not all just born blobs. So tell us more, Jan. Um, well, this is not exactly in that books that I, I uh, introduced, um, but probably a little bit. Um, but I can explain a little bit of what, what I know. Uh, have you watched a movie that's uh, uh, called Three Strangers? Um, I something called Three Str- Strangers, Identical Strangers. Um, there, 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 there's a documentary of uh, twins, actually triplets. Um, they uh, were born in the 1920s or 1930s, and the psychologists did, uh, they were doing experiment, and there were some probably kind of poor uh, families. Um, they, they purposefully took the twins to three families, different families to, to raise, and they wanted to, to see the nature and nurture um, kind of debate that, that had been going on for, for hundred years. And they thought like uh, the twin studies uh, provide, there are a lot of twin studies like provide uh, background for understanding nature and culture uh, difference. So uh, they were actually in the United States in the 1920s and 30s, they had I don't know, hundreds or at least 20 or 30 um, twins and triplets um, taken to different families to raise. And the psychologists follow them. They interview them like every year and they have records of their uh, behavior. Um, And they, they kind of as an experiment actually. Um, it was very fascinating that um, there was a, there was an incident when one twin um, went to college and someone some classmates said, "Oh, welcome back." And he thought, "Why did they say welcome back?" I never I was like my first time in college like and then he someone else figured out they must be they must have a twin that they thought welcome back. It was because another twin brother who went to the college. And then they became kind of curious, excited. They called the twin. The twins themselves, they didn't know that they had twins because they were taken apart from different families and no one told them. So they, they, um, they told um, the other twin and I said, I think you have a twin. And he now is attending this school. And they met and they found out like they have a lot of similarities, like even the way they dress, the way they talk, they were raised in totally different families and different class. But their behavior, um, even like um, their hobbies, a lot of things are very, very similar. And then the third twin, uh, the triplets, (laughs) 
so uh, so the newspaper reporters came and interviewed them and became like a big news in a small town. And then someone said, you must have related to this twin. And uh, they told him and that the three of them got together and they found they were triplets who, who were raised uh, differently. Um, and, and the three triplets got together and a lot of like news media interviewed them and talked to them and uh, they were kind of became famous. And then they opened a restaurant, three, three of them opened the restaurants together and was like kind of successful. Um, to cut a story short, I'll remember, or you can search, like I actually watched that. I watched two times in a theater. It's a documentary because it's something that I found is very fascinating. It's documentary and it's uh, triplets raising three different families. They had traits that are very similar, but they also had traits that are very different. One of them committed suicide during that documentary. So it, it, so it kind of like tells you that there's something that um, when, when, when triplets, when twins were born, there are things that kind of hardwired that's kind of um, there, but then life experiences also make them di different. So, so that, 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 I mean, and- um, it's, uh, we don't know to what extent it is, uh, to what extent nature play a role, to what extent culture plays a role. Both play, plays a role. I now kind of think it's kind of like 50-50 and depending on what kind of traits, some traits, some traits, um, probably more than 50, some less, um, but definitely there is something yeah, that yourself, I'm sorry about that, Charlie. I got to leave for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. So just keep going ahead and I think we'll be okay. Can you temporarily moderate for me real quick, please? All right. All right. Sorry about that, guys. I'm not going to sign off, but uh, my apologies. Okay. Go on, Julian. Julian. Oh, so Margaret, did I answer your question? Your bet. I can't can't hear you, Margaret. I think it's so interesting. Uh, and, interesting. In other words, um, you might have people reared in totally different families with very different values, and yet <clears throat> these two people, when they come together, realize how much they are alike. Yeah. And, in the womb together, conceived their twins or triplets even. Yeah. I think it's intriguing. You, you know, there's a homozygous that, uh, and there, there's uh, um, like like the same, same egg and two twins or different eggs and twi twins. Actually that kind of uh, twins, they have different behaviors. If they were from same egg, their behavior are more likely to be to be similar. If they are not, it's uh, they will be less like likely, but they still have like uh, some some same tra traits. And I know a friend who um, who has two uh, like they have two daughters, and one daughter was kind of like um, very warm, um, and another daughter. She, uh, when 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 a mother tries to hug her, she just push mother away, even as a baby. So that's like, like some kind of we don't know exactly why, but she told me, and I believe her, is that 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 not everyone was born exactly same. Mm -hmm. And could this uh, uh, final question? Could what goes in, on in the womb? affect the, yes i mean because i i've known somebody that was a very anxious human being yes. very nervous uh and actually later it was discovered that the mother through every pregnancy became sicker at the end with postpartum depression so yes. at the time this person was being carried in the womb no doubt the mother was very anxious over this pregnancy didn't want it 
So I just think this is intriguing that we're so affected. Goodness, poor little babies, what we do to them. All right, next, Ellen. Okay, okay, thank you. Ellen, um, now this is a question period. I, I understand, yeah. I, uh, I guess the question um, I have is related to, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with personality, uh, the complete dummies guide to personality profiles. <laughs> but um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, they divide them into there's fear based and uh, dramatic based and eccentric based, uh, but also these bowel survey. But I guess, and, and just related to that other question about siblings, uh, have you ever seen anything like like, I think I'm more like my father's family. My sister's more like my mother's family. And one's more narcissistic and one is more selfless. I don't know if you've ever seen that kind of uh, profiling, but I, I know we also see it. There's studies of masculine versus feminine countries, an IBM study that um, makes America a very masculine country. But, uh, and I, I guess my main thing is how can we become more, how can we deal with this increasingly masculized, I think, politicized country, NATO? <laughs> um, All right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a very big question. I think uh, <laughs> the first thing is the awareness. Like, if you are not aware, a lot of people are not aware. Uh, only when you compare and, and uh, study other cultures, then you have awareness. Are we more masculine? Uh, if, if you don't compare, don't have awareness, a uh, lot of people just think like we are the best. Um, uh, American exceptionalism, right? We are the best and things should be like this. Uh, then there's no possibility of uh, making it uh, a more uh, balanced state. So if more people are aware that, that we are, I, I think too, Americans are more masculine and be, uh, in general, um, it, with this awareness, then um, we might want to seek a balance, right? It's, uh, so that's my message is to seek understanding before judgment. Without the awareness, there is no um, possibility of wanting to um, change our balance. Mm -hmm. You know, that reminds well, I, me, of the, let me just follow Ellen, up on that. Charlie. Ellen, we're moving on. It's just a, a follow, everybody else had a follow up question. All right, Charlie, okay, this though. adds to it. Okay, the the Myers Briggs breaks it down into perceiving versus judging, um, and I wonder if that might have something. Thinking versus feeling. Uh, it sounds like I think that fits that paradox. And there's exercises you can do to try to be more of the middle yeah, with the yeah. Myers Briggs. Yeah. Test, yeah. right? Yeah. I, 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 I'm aware. I think that some people are more like in the middle um, and some people are more in the extreme. Actually, the society needs both. If everyone is in the middle, you don't have creativity. You don't have like leader because everyone like <laughs> is in the middle of the road. But if everyone is extreme, then you will have more conflicts. And also, even if, if you are like more on the extreme side, the awareness of your personality on the extreme side will hopefully help you to try to rebalance and not to, to be on the extreme side. Um, again, it's the awareness. There's like, in general, like personality or thinking, style there's nothing inherently good or bad but with awareness we can be more reflective and to expand our um 
horizon and to become a more balanced and holistic person. Mm -hmm. All right, Raj. Hi, Jian. Hello. Hi. I'm on. Hi. Uh, you, you talked about a uh, wide variety of experiences person has that has impact on uh, how they think. And uh, uh, so I was wondering that, uh, I mean, this, this is a little political, uh, that politicians who doesn't have much experiences by a variety of experiences, and they come from their little area, and that's why they lived on their life. Is there a difference, I mean, does it, does it make a difference on their thinking in a way they behave, they argue, and uh, they vote? Do you get me? Not really. <laughs> okay, you say, you say for amount, kind of experiences people have, they have uh -huh. more different kind of experiences. Yeah. Okay, they are more thinking people. Yeah. Right. Do you say that? I you wanna say that I, I wanna say politicians are more thinking people. Um mm -hmm. I think people uh who attend college or complexes are just as thinking <laughs> as um politicians, um even more so. It's hard to say who is more thinking or, or not, but um politicians. Some of them may be more reflective. Some of them may be less reflective. Some of them may be motivated by more by profit, uh, by personal interests. Um, it's hard to, to, to say. Um, and it's hard to, to, to say in general, uh, they are probably, I, I, would, I would probably say that most people who run for office are more like uh, in terms of in and a young, they are more on the young side. They are more masculine. They are more uh, ambitious um, for good or bad. Um, they, are, they want to, um, either make a difference in a good way or to, um, to achieve some personal um, interests. Um, it's hard to, okay. it's hard okay, to. Let, let, me, let, let, me, let me just little modify it, okay? Uh, there are two congressmen, okay? One has traveled all over the country and has traveled to Europe, traveled to China, and other hasn't. Will they will they be different in the liberal or conservative disposition? Um, traveling to different places might help to be more open than never go outside of say Texas, never go outside of US may be more open, but um, there are also people who have a lifelong biases um, just by traveling to a different places may not change their lifelong biases. It could help them to see things differently, but probably it would take more than just traveling to change biases. Thank you. Yeah, well. All right, anyone else with a question who hasn't had one? All right, I have a question, Jeanne. I was a reference librarian and you, you actually say, are you actually advancing that the person with less information is in a more advantageous position? Is this your assertion? The person with less information? No, not at well, all. Well, you said they, oh, the government had access to all this information and still didn't do any good. 
I well. <laughs> so all the people who came in for the library looking for information, such as businessmen, uh, were just wasting their time, I guess. Um, you misread um, that part of oh. presentation. First of all, um, I, I, heard not, you. I I didn't I didn't say the more information, the more bias you are. I'm only presenting the result by uh, by the author of super forecasting that he said uh, his team. Um, versus the uh, intelligence, the CIA team in predicting some world affairs and, and his team um, beat the CIA by 30%. And even though they didn't have access to some documents, internal documents the CIA has, but that doesn't mean that they are not seeking out information. They are actually seeking out information in the libraries. They just don't, didn't see the sum of the internal documents. It doesn't mean they just shut themselves out and just think in their mind. They, they, uh, they not only seeking out information, probably in the libraries, but they also uh, keep on updating their information. So, and they are also using analytical tools and probabilistic tools to assess the information. So that's, that's why they did better. It, it, I didn't say anything about, you don't need to learn information to be a good predictor. If you were in charge of an army, if you were General Gian, would you have a unit called military intelligence in order to win a battle? Yeah, yeah, yes, the, the key but is- if it's, just, if, if it's just having intelligent people it, using these guys. Yes, stuff. the key is to, to, choose, to choose people wisely, to know these are the people who are like, um, who are able to, uh, look into wide variety of sources and to update their information constantly and not to be limited by their preconceived assumptions. If you are limited by your preconceived assumptions and you never change your preconceived assumptions, whatever information you have is not going to help you as much as being the ability to be open-minded and to update your information and change your previous assumptions. So you have to choose people wisely and you have who All can right. better. Okay. I uh, Can I follow on? Is there anybody on the phone? Ellen, will you let me chair? Is there anybody uh, on the phone? I don't know. would like to ask a question? I can't see. Anyone on the phone? I wanted to ask one, uh, unless somebody has a new one. Um, All right, Ellen. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Regarding the CIA, you know, it depends on whether, I wonder if the study took into account whether they were the covert operations type who are more like Alan Dulles, you know, out there doing assassinations and uh, surveillance, which is kind of like preconceived um, operations versus like special forces, Nazis, <laughs> and, um, or whether they are actual analysts like, um, Ray McGovern said, we don't have many of as much of those in since the early 80s. But, um, you know, there there is a, sadly a military intelligence, uh, you know, where they are authoritarian following instructions and um, doing uh, all sorts of dirty things <laughs> versus 
Absolutely. really analyze it. So I think it, you know, that kind of t should tell you maybe why they were not as good as even That's an information research. I'm wondering, okay, so was IARPA related to DARPA? Um, you know, I mean, I, I just wonder if there is any more information about exactly how they do this test. It's, you say it's kind of open, but uh, I mean, I would think that'd have a huge difference. Um, and it just shows the importance of culture and the objectives of the organization on what you could do. Uh huh. Okay. Charlie, I have a question, another question. Well, let Jeanne answer that if she can figure out what the question was. <laughs> Did you understand my question? Uh, uh, so, Alan, Alan uh, do you want do you want me to answer your question? Yes, please. Yeah, I, you know, whether was it covert operations type uh -huh. CIA or actual intelligence analyst. Just looking at, um, you know, databases. I, I think I, um, I think the the in the book, it's just general. Uh, it's not anything covert because uh, it, it's a it, it it's a book that everyone can read. I don't think they will put something as secretive for COVID to to be publicized. So I think it's ge general. Um, Mm -hmm. All right, Raj. The CIA is a compromise. Ellen, kind of please, we're going on. The next one, Raj is next. Uh, Gianna, uh, I know, I'm sorry, I forgot some notes. I did not make it uh, on my question. But uh, again, the CIA question you brought in front, and then a fox and some other animal, you compare that. And it, it, gave, it gave me impression that uh, larger experience than a, than a specialty experience, there is a difference in results. Like a fox is smarter, and instead of CIA, the outside group, okay, there are wider experiences, different kind of experiences, they come out better. Am I right, am I wrong? Um, I think you're right, I, I, I think, what the book sa says is that um, the, the super predictors are the people who have more like uh, fox, or oh, just a metaphor fo fo fox uh, qualities that they um, can see many different things at, at, at the same time. Um, whereas um, hedgehog, will only see um, things through one lens. Um, so if the CIA officers have a preconceived views about what things would go and they are not looking at different perspectives from say what's happening in Iraq, from Iraqi perspectives, then they are less likely to predict how, um, how things would develop in, in Iraq, right? You will have to know from uh, both your view and you, it's essential to know if it's your enemy, especially you have to know your, your enemy, uh, how they think, but if you don't know how they think, of course, you wouldn't be able to predict th things, right? So some people who, who, I can use this word, tunnel vision, if you have a tunnel vision, uh, you think you're always right, but it's likely you're not always right, right um, because you are unable to see a wider, um, social political um, perspectives other than what you think. So the super, con that, that's my, one of my quotation is how you think is more important than what you think. If you don't have a, 
critical mind uh, ability to see different perspectives. Even with a lot of information, you don't know how to handle the information. All right, basically oh. done. Can I, can, can I do a little, little more? Uh, Gian, uh, uh, can, you, can you give, if you have insight into that, how uh, President Biden thinks in, in terms of what you are talking? I have, I have no answer. I don't know how he thinks. I, I, I have never met him. I've never talked to him. I haven't read much. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, okay. I have all right, Margaret Aguilar. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I, I remember reading a critique of the twin studies that's, and um, and and triple studies saying that many of the twins that were separated at birth were actually adopted into the extended family, and so that the the twins kind of shared family backgrounds, even though they didn't really know that they were related to each other. Um, but I don't know if that's the the sample that they that they had for this study. Um, it sounded from what you were saying is that is that the researchers actually took people's children away from them and, and put them in different things. And that mm -hmm. was the sample for this study. And mm -hmm. so the question is, I want to know what the sample size was. Okay, so Vicky, I'm, I'm reading the chat. Vicky uh, wrote, the name of the movie is called Three Identical Strangers. Now I remember that's right. So uh, you might be able to find a movie in, um, I don't know now, uh, um, documentary, uh, Three Identical Strangers. And in that movie, it um, talked about there was a secret psychological study being done, taking um, twins and triplets into different families and on purpose to different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, like doctors versus like blue collar workers. Um, and they did this in the name of scientific study. And there was a lawsuit by these three uh, um, uh, twin triplets they actually tried to look for more information and they tried to uh, publicize the, this. And it's a, it's a documentary, so worth looking, Three Identical Strangers. I don't, I don't remember the sample size. It has at least, I think at least like 30 or 40 uh, twins and triplets. And I don't know what happened to the documents now. On the one hand, well, it's in the name of science and uh, probably it was in the name of science, but on the other hand, it's kind of inhuman to do this to these kids. Like they knew they were twins and tri triplets and they never told them until they found out in by, in by chance. Wow. And then to right. is that... okay. Vicky's... Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that if yeah, I might. Vicky's next. Vicky. Um, okay, this isn't a question, but the three identical strangers, as yeah. I, if I recall correctly, Probably. the records are locked. Mm -hmm. um, I think till a date when it's likely that, you know, the two remaining brothers will no longer be alive. <laughs> and it's kind of a shame, I don't know, I just like to know more. But I do think that the mother was diagnosed as schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. um, I can't quite recall the reason for the suicide, but it wasn't only different, they weren't only different socioeconomically, their parenting styles were very different too. Mm -hmm. One was very rigid and rule oriented and another was more permissive. <laughs> and I, I think it would be really fascinating to see those records 
But I also think the film is worth viewing. That's all I have to say. Okay. Um, I don't know where we're at, Charlie, with the questions, but I'm sorry I had to leave. Well, I've got my hand raised. Okay, and then anybody else tonight that we had missed so far? I I have one or two actually. Go All ahead, right. Doug. All right, Doug. Okay, um, very quickly, uh, these uh, super forecasters are most of them rich. Um. Well, I I don't think the author uh, is explicitly said they were uh, rich, but implicitly, I would say yes, because they were uh, highly educated. They, uh, they- I mean, I mean, did they get rich from super forecasting is what no, I no, mean. No, 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 no. They, they didn't uh, uh, profit for, for this. They did this um, just uh, as curiosity. They were not paid. They were this not paid. Long. But they were highly educated, and most of them. Okay, are well then it means nothing then. Yeah, I think it makes some money. No, 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 no. It, it's more for uh, for academic. No. Uh, it's not for profit. Oh, I, I forgot what my second was. So go ahead, Charlie. All right, uh, Jan. I, I believe, according to you, the definition of a culture would be. Uh, Truly, <laughs> would be, uh, and I even I forgot my question here. Um, I, I def your definition of a culture are uh, a, a bunch of people who inherited the same personality traits. Oh, no, no, had the same experience. Not that not they were pregnant. Charlie, Charlie, you should. Well, I probably shouldn't say frame this way. Everybody inherited Ask the same me, what do you think that the definition of culture, instead of guessing what's my definition, it, it should be better to be phrased it as an open-ended question so I can ans answer you. Um, the cult, there, there are several different ways of defining culture. I'm a cultural anthropologist. I'll give you a short answer. Yeah, I know. Actually, the definition of culture, a shortest definition of culture is it's a learned behavior. Thank culture you. is a learned behavior. And then a, a little bit more involved is culture is something learned and it's shared. If it's just learned, but it can be uh, idiosyncratic. If it's idiosyncratic, it is syncretic and learned, it's not a culture. So the second characteristic of culture is it's shared. And the third um, characteristic culture, it's culture is more enduring. It passed down from one generation to, to another. And the fourth element of culture is that culture changes. If we don't recognize culture changes, then you have a stereotypical view of the culture. So it has to be learned, to be shared, endure, um, passed down from one generation to another, and the culture changes. The change, the pace of change of culture is slower than politics. Politics can, can, uh, can be rapid. You, you can change um, in a few months, a few years, but culture usually doesn't change uh, very rapidly, right? It takes generations to, to change. One follow-up. Our children, our babies in China born with different brains than children in the United States. You and I have two different brains. Of course not. If you say I if, said if yin -yang, no, church. if if anyone holds that view, whether you or me, I would not hesitate to call this out as being racist because you're implying a whole group of people, whole population of people as being different. People all over the world are more or less same. same. So that doesn't mean individuals are all the same. But in terms of probabilistic is population, within the population, you have introvert, extrovert, you have people who are more thinking versus people who are more feeling, but that's 
within the population, not within country. Any assertion of any country have people who smart or dumber, better or worse, is a runs the risk of being racism, racist. If you truly uh, respect different cultures, then you was you will not label any group of people as being essentially different. Okay, Gianna, yeah, I, got can, I have a, could I follow up question with that? Um, okay, Tim, I'm uh, gonna let Raj go. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, yeah, I'm gonna let Raj. Go ahead, Ellen. I wonder, yeah, yeah, about, I've been reading more about eugenics and and how what a real phenomena that was in the early part of the century. A lot of the research scientists who you know wanted the Nazis wanted to make a perfect person and you know get rid of the call out the the imperfect ones and um and so I you know I agree that's racist but I you know um is this taken into consideration in anthropology um differently than psychology because i think freudian psychology or a lot behavioral psychology a lot of these twin studies you know looking at genetics um there was i, mean, I think a hidden agenda there to really maybe determine whether they were superior like darwin might have i don't think darwin said that but there were darwin ethics <laughs> darwinists that were trying to um trying to uh you know white exceptionalism and um you know find those support for their racist chauvinistic <laughs> white exceptionalist uh you know world domination theories okay go ahead gianna answer the question and i'll let raj go um so do, do you is your question about difference between psychologists and anthropologists about eugenics yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. I, yeah. Or just I, your knowledge of. I well, um, if we're well, talking about psychologists and anthropologists, um, you, they, they're they're something related and something different. Anthropologists study uh, cultures, um, usually study um, the indigenous cultures that are disappearing. Um, whereas um, um, psychologists, especially American psychologists, focus more on um, individuals and uh, uh, college educated Americans, and that's just easy target to study. And uh, both anthropologists and, and uh, psychologists are limited by, um, in, in some ways, it's like time, like in the before the 1960s, there are just more biases, uh, consciously or unconsciously, there are more biases. Um, but now um, I think we are making progress and, and um, uh, we see people uh, everywhere, at, they are more or less same and their difference are more um, limited by um, economic, um, political situations. So when I say, on the one hand, as humans, we are all the, we, human populations as a group, we are more or less same. On the other hand, each individual is unique. So the difference is more of the uniqueness of individuals and in each population. I, I don't want to go too uh, deeply in a controversial. There was someone in a college complex talk about bell curve, uh, which I don't, really agree with, but I can use another analogy about, about a bell curve just in general is like uh, most people are kind of 
most people are kind of in the uh, the bell curve range, whereas their exceptionally genius or is uh, or someone is except exceptionally low IQ. You we cannot deny that these people do exist. But most of us, like here at the college complex, we are more or less like in the same curve, not exactly same, more or less same, right? But that we cannot say a group of people, whether whether Asians or Blacks or Jews, that they are as a group, they they are different. That's racism. But within the population, within the Caucasians, within Asians, within Blacks, they are differences, right? They are differences. So it's not that we cannot talk about differences, but we cannot label any group of people just because skin color, just because they, they were raised in another country, the whole group of people, they are different. They are better or they are worse. That is racist, but we are all unique individuals. Mm -hmm. That's my position. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Roger okay. next, and then Charlie. Uh, the, the, the end, uh, I, I understand what you are saying. Uh, and apart from racism, uh, uh, we know that uh, DNA, it kind of a, it changes and it stays streamlines sometime over generations in the same culture. So there is, is there is something like cultural DNA. And a second thing, you are right, we are all equal at a birth or something, but then there may not be because of whatever woman's experience is that, okay? And that might have some impact. And secondly, and thirdly, that when once child is born in a culture, either born in China or born in the United States, culture rushes in right away. And a culture impacts child every single day, every single hour. And uh, basically, even though they are born same, they are, they, don't stay, they change is very fast. And they try to be part of the culture they are born. Isn't it true? Cultural DNA is just a metaphor. It's not, in not, it's not same as genetic DNA. A genetic DNA is something that cannot be changed, but cultural DNA can be cha changed. Um, I know of like children being adopted, like either like from China adopted here in the US then this child will be just like every other American child, that there's nothing about inherently cultural DNA in this child when they move to, to the US and they will be still inherent Chinese DNA. That's not true. As same as like um, another, whatever culture, whatever country, if a child was adopted in a family, it's more the child will adapt to the local culture. Um, culture shapes individual behavior, yes. Um, and cultural values shape individual behavior, yes. Um, but it's not deterministic. Uh, individuals still have his or her own volition to, to choose or to, to reject, right? We are malleable. We are not set. Um, so cultural DNA is a, like a metaphor, but it's not same as genetic um, um, DNA. A genetic DNA, like my black hair, I can't. I can only dye my hair red, but I cannot expect it will go red, red right? But that's a genetic, I cannot change. Um, but culturally, I can choose to be black hair or red, red hair, hair, right? And so culturally, you, you do have a choice to, to, to change, but usually 
the people are not aware how much we are influenced by the culture. And without the awareness, you are just doing the things you have been doing all your life. Thank you. Don't okay. you have... Uh, it's Charlie's turn next. Yeah, Jan, when babies are born, are boy babies different than girl babies? Of course they are different. Are you not different from... from or are they the same? When you say same or different, you have to be more specific. In what ways are you talking about? Every individual is unique, not only male and female, but even two males can be different. You are not exactly the same as your brother or sister. Of course it's different. Okay, hey, Jeanne, I got a question. Yes. Um, you've been talking about super forecasting and mm -hmm. the yin and the yang of both and how a group can, um, can you know, make a more accurate forecast when you include the yin and the yang. Where does things like trend analysis, um, flows of market capital, um, and other items that they normally use for prediction fall into place? That's a very big question. I, um, I, I think the general rules that in super forecasting will help you to uh, to predict um, for different things, in, including I would like to think, including the stock market. If you um, you are willing to update information and to uh, taking different perspectives, you should be able to predict better than someone who only uses one or two sources of information and who always believe uh, he is right. Um, the willingness of to negate your own preconceived views will make you a better forecaster on many different things. Well, the reason I ask is because, you know, one of the biggest trends over the next century is the declining birth rate worldwide, which means we're going to be solving our um, population problems. And that can be easily extracted by the fact that children are going to be a lot more expensive to raise. And it costs about a million dollars to raise a kid these days in a Western country. So people are not going to have five or six, but they'll have one or two. That's a very simple forecast. Um, yeah. You know, and that that's probably agreed with both conservative and uh, political alike. You know, and we all know too that when it comes to like the growth of the internet and the market of technology and everything else, you know, it's done some traumatic changes in our own lives. You know, um, some of those trends and stuff can be done and found easily on the internet in some very comprehensive and deep studies. And I'm just not sure that if you're trying to predict, if you just did, somebody's probably done it for you already in, in, a, in a good analysis, uh, where does that fit into your methodology of super forecasting? Are you, are you asking a particular trend about population increase? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm asking when you go into your own methodology of super forecasting with this guy, uh, where, does the, uh, where does the information predictions, the trends, and other uh, outside forces of data analysis and uh, just plain common sense fit into the methodology? I think there are basically two aspects. One aspect is the ability to collect different sources of information. And the second aspect is how you handle the information. So the first aspect, depending on the research project, uh, the more different sources of information you get, the better you are informed. And uh, the other aspect is your willingness not to 
stick to your preconceived uh, assumptions, that your willingness to update and change uh, what you believed to be true. Uh, some people um, cannot be a good forecast, forecaster because they are not willing to change their ideology, even with the new information. Um, so if you can gather information from different sources and keep an open mind and willingness to change your preconceived notions, you are more likely to be a good forecaster. So in other words, what you're telling me is that if, for example, I want to find out what's going on with the war in Ukraine, it might not be a bad idea not only to check out the American sources of like the B, of, of like uh, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox, but also check out like uh, Deutsche Welle, the, and then of course the Iran, um, the, uh, you know, I'm sorry, Press TV, which is out of Iran, and then of course RT itself, which is a Russian or TAS, the Russian news agency, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that that's exactly uh, right. If uh, I think um, in terms of international news, um, it, it's very important to read sources outside of the U.S. because um, there's not much uh, diverse voices in 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 reporting international news um, from the mainstream media. So if you really want to know how to achieve peace, then it is important to see other sources of information. I think, unfortunately, a lot of news that we have today is kind of for consumerism, uh, things that make people uh, feel excited in one way or another, instead of being analytical to see from different perspectives. Okay, Th thanks, Jan. I, I I know I threw you a Why couple. Want to go to, to, go go to, to rebuttals, rebuttals now? Yeah. Well, yeah, if anybody else has any questions, we can go to. Re without any more questions, we'll go to rebuttals. I, my my question is. I, I have a question. Okay, L and H, and then Doug. Baker, uh, okay, well, I, I'm just curious because I thought that was an interesting point you brought up. Ken. What what kind of um, outside news sources do you recommend? Well, <laughs> I'll just I'll just be very brief. I not you, Tim. <laughs> actually, actually, um, I'm I'm less and less uh, interested in uh, in news. Um, Possibly because I don't have time and I don't feel like uh, I can make real difference by really knowing uh, all sources of information. Um, uh, sometimes like if there's a question that uh, especially interesting uh, to me, I might just like uh, Google and then I try to read uh, different voices on the same topic, but I don't really, like I'm not a news junkie. That's why like the talks I give are not like, current news opinion. I'm more interested in, um, in things that like in knowing how to think clearly on different things um, instead of like keep myself uh, update to uh, everything what's going on in, in the world. Only occasionally I might just Google and try to find different interpretations, but I'm not really um, that much like spent time uh, um, in the current affairs. I just feel that's not the best use of my time. Okay, uh, yeah, Doug, you got, Doug, you got the last question. Okay, yeah, my my question is, did these um, prognosticators, how great they are, did they uh, predict uh, that uh, Putin would actually 
attack Ukraine in such a vicious manner. So what's the question? The, the, the prognosticators that you said, the, the great predictors, whatever title you gave them, uh, did they predict that Putin would actually attack Ukraine in such a vicious manner? I, and can they predict that there's uh, going to be an end to this thing in any time anytime I, I, soon? I don't really know. You can check that website. Um, what is the website again? Sorry. The, the, the website, um, it's on one of the, so there's a welcome to good judgment that that's on my list. And that's the last one. It's in the chat there. Yeah, yeah it's in the chat, chat is G, G, like G for good, jopen.com. And they post a lot of, um, current affairs. So if you are interested and in see what kind of qu questions um, well, asked. Well, I thought you'd know that off the top of your head. I mean, it's really the most important. I, I, as I said, I'm not a news junkie. I don't. <laughs> news I, junkie. I, okay. I mean, I'm not. I, if there's I'm a not terrorist saying, attack, will you notice it in time? Do you have I'm a not stack of water a and of food time. in your house? Or, or, I'm not spending a lot of time. And okay. I don't, All right. If it happens, don't ask me for anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right, um, let's rebuttal. I think it's time for rebuttals now. Yeah, let's Who's take our speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Gian, thanks for a good presentation. Thank you. Very good. All right, I'm going to give everybody about four minutes. Who wants to speak tonight? I do. Okay, Ellen Corley, I got his first. Yeah, I do too. Okay, let's go. Okay, I got Ellen Cor right. Corley. I got Margaret. You got it right. Okay. Uh, I, I'll give a short rebuttal. Um, right, Ellen right, let, let, let me go. I got Ellen. I got I got Ellen Corley. I got Margaret. I have Raj. You got me. I have uh, Steve Grossman, right? I'm sorry. I because to all right, I have Ellen, I have Margaret, I have Raj. I have Charlie. Bob Matter. I'm Bob Matter. Ellen, the other Ellen. Okay. <laughs> Ellen Corley. I got you. I got no, Ellen, other Ellen. Yeah, other Ellen wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ellen Thanks. H. Thanks, Ellen. <laughs> okay. And uh, so, so I have six so far Ellen Corley, Margaret Raj, Charlie, Bob Matter, and Ellen H. Anybody else? Okay. Um, all right, then I'll go. All right, I'm mean, here's the order I'm going to put you guys in if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to do Ellen Corley first. I'm going to do Margaret. I'm going to do Raj. I'm going to do Bob Matter, Ellen H, then me, and then Charlie. Is that agreeable with everybody? Um, I, I'd actually like to go after uh, Bob Matter because he usually comes up with some weird shit. All right, so I'll put Ellen Corley. <laughs> And then I'll put Bob Matter next. Here we go. Okay, so now we got it. Ellen Corley, Bob Matter, Margaret, Raj, Ellen H, myself, and Charlie. Is that re 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 agreeable, everybody? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I'm going to do a clock at four minutes. So, uh, Ellen Corley, you got four minutes to start, and then we'll go with Bob Matter. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, thanks so much, Jan. This was wonderful. Uh, I. I like, I mean, I see that you are providing a solution to our, our conflicts and um, it's, it's an interesting area of uh, inquiry uh -huh. discipline. Um, and, um, you know, I like your, your anthropology background and your balance and your Confucianism. Um, and some insights that came to me were, um, the, you know, regarding Tim's idea about prediction that I, you know, was a, a, a market research intelligence analyst um, and, you know, studied how to do that. And it's basically investigation is the field I got into and predictions, you know, um, and it, I've come to see that it's a matter of hypothesis, you know, you, or you're doing exploratory, uh, you know, look, before it was always just the client gives you anything, but 
and we do like an environmental scan, a qualitative research first to uncover the issues. And then you can drill down into, um, you know, the questions, you know, after maybe focus groups or in-depth interviews, but it's, it's, and I also read the investigative journalism is about the, it's always the hypothesis. And I thought that's kind of simplistic, but it, I, what makes me angry, I now, I've listened to the media, I'm kind of a, a media analyst critic, you know, I see that the media is not asking the right questions or for, you know, the right hypotheses. We're being, you know, like manufactured into consent or decent or dumbness. Um, and uh, I, I think here in, I didn't understand when I was first gonna teach mass media as a teacher, um, you know, because I just thought advertising, propaganda, that's a good thing. But if you, you know, imagine that our media is really owned by one media monopoly that's formed by the CIA and uh, NATO, and is just pushing one, you know, America, Putin bad, America good. That is why we used to have a, in 1948, the same year the CIOs formed, they came up with the FCC Fairness Doctrine. And they said, we can, there's a rule, you can't do Voice of America, uh, Radio Free Europe propaganda on Americans. You, they let them, they didn't care if they did it to everybody else. Um, you know, fight communism by, you know, America's great, you know, and kill communists. But, uh, you know, they, they have crossed that line. And, uh, you know, by getting William Casey sabotaged the fairness doctrine, threw it out. Now they have a total media monopoly owned by virtually one company, BlackRock. And it's, um, and they're just pushing us into war. So um, and regarding perspectives, I see Scott Ritter, uh, two and a half hours. This guy was a NATO, he worked for the UN. He, he was a weapons inspector. And I, I highly recommend you watch um, uh, The Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal and Aaron Maté, because they're really the way an analyst thinks. And you know they talk to this very conservative, good old boy Southerner, but he, he's like, this is how we operate. And, and Max Blumenthal is just totally open-minded and, um, they're like, hmm, it's it's very interesting to hear kind of their yang and their yang, um, you know, in terms of, but it's really being open to, and I think seeking the peace. It it depends on whether you're what's your objective. And to if we're seeking peace, which is what you hear Stephen Cohen, this Russian expert, um, you're Matt, and also I'm taking a class now, it's just wonderful on propaganda by Mark Crispin Miller. He's been doing it for 40 years, and I mean he. He just, he, to understand propaganda, I've heard actually the Chinese just call it advertising propaganda, which is kind of funny, but you know, um, it is a bad thing. It is a dangerous thing. And um, it's like McCarthy era. And it's really playing on, um, you know, jingoism and, and it's dangerous. And that's why we come up with education. We need to re-regulate the media. So, um, but anyhow, thank you for your observations. They, they did make me see the importance of the hypothesis, the um, independence and the lack of willfulness um, and the lack of superiority. Okay, That's I'll just like so important. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Now, Bob Matter, you wanna, you're next. So uh, go ahead for four minutes, please. Bob Matter, are you there? Bob Matter, uh, yeah, Bob, can you go next, please? Bob? Bob Matter, are you there? Okay, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to, okay, Raj, I'll get you, Margaret, after Bob goes. Raj, go ahead. Okay, Raj, you're up next. Okay, okay, uh, Gian, the I also like you find politics are too much confusing and too much too much clutter, and I go to Google mostly to research, and uh, I read articles once in a while, and and I get New York Times, so I, I quickly scan through that. Uh, the the second thing, uh, 
what you are saying about, uh, I think you are too careful in terms of a DNA and the outside knowledge person gets after person is born and moving on. I'm not, I'm not that careful because uh, there are so many things going on and I think people are culturally impacted, impacted too much and very fast and very early, you know, and, and I go through international uh, search thing, like what, is, what, is, what Japanese kids are doing, How, are they bullies or are they very subdued? And all those things I, I do, and I, I get more knowledge. And uh, it looks like a kids are impacted, and there is no two way about it. And DNA is a different story. It's right, your head, in your skin color, all those things. But but when it comes to real predictability, that is super predictability you talk about. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's all all about knowledge. It's all about the person's capacity in a person's exposure, age, person experience are there. That really matters. And uh, the the what it is. I, I don't I don't see you are you are afraid to take position or what. I don't understand. And and maybe maybe that's not the nature of the talk. And I might be making a mistake. But but uh, there, there are those things going on, old and young. You know. I just, for me, for example, okay, I'm not trying to make a politics, but but Joe Biden had been there for so long, and I personally, I believe rightly or wrongly, I believe he had a grudge and he had a problem with with by from Putin, and he ex he exercised that that particular prejudice and not a rational decision making like how many people are going to die or how many what is going to happen to the world and, and what, what oil or food price is going to be there, people are going to starve, economy is going to be different, world is going to be divided. Okay, all those things is impacted by Joe Biden's world and uh, all their 40 or 50 years he spent in Congress. Now, if he would, if he would have been a little bit more thing, different. Even, even Obama, Obama, was, Obama was not there, not very happy about Joe Biden, so every time he lost, he lost it with the Congress to pass a bill. He gave away everything. Okay, but but anyway, talking about it, we have to. It is important not not for the for politicians are, but the people to understand that person with a more experience, person with a more thinking, and a person who is contact with more variety of people and a variety of cultures. They are better suited to lead our country and to be congressman and to be a leader. If we cannot do that, and then there is a problem. If the people comes out with a culture, I mean, so gay and gay are bad, abortion is bad, and they try to do something, this is a wrong. And where it comes from, and that comes from that, that close-mindedness, that sometimes you sometimes you, you you allude to it, and then you back away, and I don't understand. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Looks like Bob Matter signed off, so I'm going to give Margaret a chance to go next. If okay. You're ready. Yeah. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to. Uh, well, first of all, I'm I'm not going to take my whole time, and if he comes back on, I want to be after him again, <laughs> but just with the two minutes I have left, I want to thank our speaker for uh, always an excellent, balanced presentation. Um, this. Um, question of, of uh, uh, nature versus nurture is, is an old one. And those the particular studies that you reported on were, were pretty obnoxious. It was sort of like watching Joseph Mengele's stuff and saying, well, what can we learn from this? And, and you know, the thing is that the people in our defense department learned from Mengele's experiments, I have to say. And, but, and that's just the way that is. So um, at any rate, and I just wanted to note to Doug that, that you were uh, commenting on studies that were uh, or commenting really on, the, on the, um, the TED presentation that this guy did and what, uh, what those kinds of, uh, and other studies that were in the past and weren't done at the at, at with any reference to current events. They were just using that as a way of deciding 
who could make the best presentation. It didn't have anything to do with the cage, current or not. Cage. Yeah, I just wanted to put the speaker on the spot. I, I actually only go up to the Mengele data. That's my Bible, the Mengele data. Okay, okay, well, let's anyway, let you. Okay, so that so that just just that, and and the thing is, is that all of this stuff about I I I hope that whoever C is is muting themselves because they're interfering. Um, the uh, it's it's still an open question and it's still being researched and it's. Uh, a lot of the stuff is really mushy, and uh, a lot of the data is really mushy about nature and, and nurture, and, and we're finding more and more, uh, uh, we've only entered the age of uh, beginning to understand brain function and how it affects personality and stuff. We're just at the very beginning of all of that. If you do, if you look at any head injury studies and, and all of those things that are in medicine, you, you see how little we really know about all that. So um, that's that's just my comment, but thank you very much. I appreciate your insights. I don't agree with them all the time, but I do appreciate them. Thank you. Okay, Margaret, uh, it looks like uh, Bob Matters entering our room again, so. Uh, I waited until I got done, so I still get a minute after him. I'll give you a minute from him. Uh, Bob Matter, <laughs> hey, where sneaky. were you? Very sneaky. Bob, you've entered the room again and we uh, got you uh, on for rebuttal, so go ahead. Bob, you're back in the room. We uh, are ready for your rebuttal. He's connecting to He's audio. Yeah, I, I know, but uh, Bob's still connecting to audio. So he, okay, Bob, are you there? Okay, I'm back. Uh, sorry about that. I I was trying to uh, unmute my phone, my, uh, my uh, speaker. And uh, I think I bumped my power cord and uh, my computer shut down. Okay. I had to reboot. And now I'm back. All right. Well, okay. you're up next for rebuttal. So you got four minutes. Okay. And I'm going to uh, let Margaret rebut you for a minute after that. So go ahead. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> geez, I had some notes in, in my, uh, in my uh, little word bad, but they're, they, they disappeared when, the, when I knocked the power cable uh, loose. So anyway, uh, but I'll try to do it from memory. So first, I, uh, for Charlie, uh, Charlie wanted to know about the origins of criminal behavior. Um, well, for bad, for really bad stuff, the, the rule of thumb is that psychopaths are born and sociopaths are made. So uh, in other words, so sociopaths, they generally have some type of mistreatment as a child, abuse or trauma or things like that, whereas psychopaths are just kind of born that way. Um, now, as far as the bell curve, um, Charles Murray made it very clear clear in his book then and, and even in his new book, uh, Facing Reality, that, um, you know, you can't judge an individual by the, by the group properties. I mean, every individual is different. There is a bell curve. There are many blacks that are smarter than many whites, you know, on that right side of the curve. However, though, there are group, you can make, uh, you know, uh, group inferences. And, uh, and that is that the, uh, you know, that, you know, Asians have the highest mean IQ. I mean, that's true. Whites are next then Hispanics, then Blacks. Now, for some reason, the Ashkenazi Jews are not counted in there as a population. Maybe they're lumped in with whites. I'm not sure. Maybe it's because they're small numbers, but they're really the top of the heap, even higher than Asians. But for some reason, they're not counted as a separate population. But, uh, uh, but and this is why when you, uh, uh, when goods, when companies like Google or Facebook uh, you know, want to hire really smart people, people with an IQ of 135, the way that mix is going to look, it's going to be 60 of the candidates will be white, 30 will be Asian, uh, about, I think, you know, six will be Hispanic, three will be black, and one will be other. And uh, so that, that's, that's the, re the reality of it. Now, um, 
along with low IQ comes a higher proclivity for crime because one thing associated with lower IQ is a failure to think about the future. Uh, and also, uh, they, you know, you have a, people with lower IQs have a tendency to have impulsive uh, behavior as well. Um, and, they, and they also happen to be less, em, uh, less, have less empathy. So that's that. Now, I wanted to make a, a point about uh, um, an interesting topic uh, as far as like predicting, and this is the, the scorpion submarine phenomena that happened in May of 1968 when the atomic submarine scorpion was lost at sea somewhere. And I believe a torpedo exploded and it went down. And normally they would have had a, the, the Navy would have assembled a panel of experts, mathematicians and uh, nautical engineers and things like that. And they would have ha had a big round table discussion. And the one guy would have tried to convince everybody else why he was correct in determining where the submarine was at. But instead, they did. They took a different tact. They had all the experts write down their prediction of where the submarine was at. And this was it was somewhere they knew that they knew it was in a twenty mile diameter radius. But that's that's an awful lot of ocean to cover. Uh, but what they did is they had every every expert write his uh, you know his uh, his estimation of where the submarine was located and then they took all those little pieces of paper and they kind of like averaged them all out and wouldn't you know it they came within about 220 yards of where that submarine actually was so that, that was kind of interesting that a group decision like that made with the, with the individual components of what everybody thought rather than letting one or two people you know powerful okay. people sway the group it's okay, Bob, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, your time's up. All right. Um, all right, Margaret, you did indicate you wanted to go a minute with uh, Bob's response. So please, Margaret, go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, Charles Murphy and uh, Murray, I'm sorry, Charles Murray and the uh, bell curve in terms of IQ have been really discounted and discredited by many respected researchers and social scientists. IQ is not regarded as a measure of anything significant unless you're, unless you're applying for admission to Mensa. There, uh, it, not really, there are, it, colleges now are not even including that. They're not including that SAT tests or, or ACT tests. They're going on things like recommendations and your cumulative grades and re uh, recommendations by uh, your teachers and all of those kinds of things. I'm repeating myself, sorry. Um, there are many factors that go into analysis of personality. IQ may or may not be one of them. IQ is, is heavily influenced. Um, IQ, because it's a measured test, is heavily influenced by your culture and society and your class that you're raised in. And so if you're raised, in, if, you, if you're a low-income family, you tend to have a, quote, lower IQ because you're not exposed to all the stuff that the, that the IQ test measures. That's one of the significant critiques of the IQ tests. And many people who have high IQs are also criminals. That's how you have this big deal with all of the, the stock market, the Goldman and Sachs and all those people. They were dummies. They were just greedy uh, people who, who uh, violated the law and, and were nasty. It just because they did it in, in a way that, that was a white collar crime doesn't mean that they're not criminal in behavior. And many people who are so-called lower IQ people or who judge that way are uh, peaceful and productive members of society. And uh, you know, for you to make all of these assumptions based on a number on a test that is absolutely not regarded as a, as, a, as a clinically significant test is really pretty obnoxious and it's racist. And that's what you come across as. Okay, okay. I'm sorry Margaret. to say it. So I'm done. Thank you. No problem. I gave you an extra minute to, uh, to finish your point. Okay, Ellen Corley, I think you're next. I'll give you four minutes. 
Oh, it, it's Ellen H. Ellen H. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you want to show um, yourself, Ellen, it'd be no problem with video if you can. <laughs> yeah, no, I think there's there is something wrong with my um, video and it doesn't work. Yeah, there's something wrong with it. I, I don't know why it's, it's an ongoing issue I have. It's a, it's a um, connection to your cameras, what it is, I think. But anyway, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I agree that Scott Ritter is, is terrific. I did, um, hear him, um, before the Iraq war and he was saying that Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction. And, um, I was pretty convinced by what he was saying and I was supposed to oppose to the war. Um, and history has bore that out that it was truthful. Um, Anyway, um, I really didn't have too much to say, but I, I would like to say that there is a, you know, um, you know, a media has an agenda setting function and it's very disturbing what is going on with our media. Um, it's, um, they're really propagandists. Um, um, they, a lot of stations only, like, like for instance, I, see, I used to, I got into the habit of listening to NPR all the time, a long time ago. Um, but then I, I see more and more that they only give one side of the story. And they, like, they were doing like the Friday roundup. And they had somebody from like the New York Times, which is leftist. The Washington Post, which is leftist, and another um, source that is a, a lefty source, they just won't put anybody on that is going to express a different opinion. And when you're talking about very serious things going on in the, wo in the world, like war, um, to just say, have one viewpoint, that is not a good thing. Um, that, that is definitely um, a dangerous um, thing to do. Um, and um, it, is, it is disturbing. So, you know, certain um, media outlets have been totally written off. Like um, a long time ago, I, you know, people completely got read off um, it, things like Fox News. Now, I'm not saying Fox News is great or that it, I agree with what goes on, but <laughs> they, they actually do have some good news programs that um, they have Glenn Greenwald on a lot. They have Tulsi Gabbard. It's good to hear diverse viewpoints. Also another great place is, is the web. Um, there, there are a lot of diverse viewpoints. It's hard to know what the truth is right now. Um, and, and of course, that, that is problematic. Maybe maybe it's always been that way, you know, that, that it's always been hard to tell what uh, the truth really is and who um, and who has the correct viewpoint. Um, I didn't know that um, Mark, uh, Ellen Corbin, you were saying that Mark Kristen Miller had some <laughs> propaganda? That, you mean like a, a, in the past he had a class on propaganda it's or he does now? This is a current one. It's three hundred dollars, but uh, um, for eight weeks. And um, I, I, if I could get a recording of it, um, I'd share it. But he, there's an introduction to it. You could type that in, or um, okay. And I shared it on the website today and stuff. Look at at Ellen Corley because I'm. It was he's you know he's always been good at propaganda. He teaches it at NYU. Yeah, but I know. This is I know. An online course that is really applied to you know, you know Ukraine and um, just his perspective in a variety of things, and uh, the pandemic is one that he's really um, been upfront at, on. And uh, yeah, and RT has been taken off altogether. Just related to your points, which is horrifying that they could just yeah. get rid yeah. of Chris so, and Lee Camp. I mean, I, I do strongly recommend that people diversify their media um, because um, it's it's disturbing what goes on and, and that's gonna, yeah, that's gonna lead to a lot of problems if we only listen to one viewpoint. Um, 
Anyway, that's all I have to say. Yeah. You come right, over Monday right. nights and listen at six. You can come over and listen with me. Maybe oh, I'll figure okay, out how to okay, your place. Okay, maybe we yeah. let's, maybe we can exchange emails afterwards. Or okay. Something. Okay, okay, yeah. guys. Uh, all right, Ellen. Ellen Corley is not vaccinated. She's anti-vaxxer. Just keep that in mind. Oh. No, I've got natural immunity I, and uh, I took monoclonal let's, let's antibodies. Let's not get into the COVID stuff right now. <laughs> I, I don't know. My 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 niece who's vaccinated gave COVID to her mother who, who was right, boosted right, and, uh, and uh, her stepfather on. who was boosted. Ellen, so, uh, Ellen, I'm Ellen, not Ellen. really too worried about this stuff. All right. Um, now let's 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 not get into this right now because we could we don't need to go down this rabbit hole right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, because my rebuttal, you know, the thing is, is that uh, I do, although I do appreciate Gian Lee's uh, analysis of super forecasting and that there has to be a yin and a yang balance, the more reliance on trends, for example, is probably your better off and your best bet. Because I can tell you right now, when I do uh, forecasting, I'm going to share my screen here and show you a few sources that I like. Oh, geez. No, no, I'm just going to share. I'm not going to do anything else. My best way to that I like to see forecasting is if I just go, to, I'm sorry, I meant to go to Google here real quick, which we'll, we'll do, is just type something like uh, so called a forecast for the next, let's see, a forecast for the next 100 years. Now you can see you'll get a, you'll get a book by George Friedman in there. But if you do something like uh, a forecast to 2040, you know, what you're going to get is there's all kinds of stuff up here. Geopolitical futures, quantum run, the hill. Uh, you know, one certain tells you it's going to be collapsing by 2040. They're actually doing tests. There are a whole bunch of stuff that goes in here. And you can find... Um, you know, several government uh, forecasts that they use, policies and predictions. And of course, the census data too, that might also help you out on a lot of this stuff. I mean, there are people whose full-time jobs it is, is to forecast markets, forecast business trends, forecast uh, the way the world's going, you know, and as far as predictions about Putin going into, going into, um, going into, uh, Ukraine, there was a lot of intelligence around, whether it was believed or not by the government, but there were people that were telling, talking about it years ago that, that you know, talked, talked about it life in there. And, you know, again, if you just keep looking at your sources and go out on the web a little bit more, you can find a lot of stuff out here. Um, you know, they have roadway plans, the Kane County uh, Division of uh, Transportation plans, and even in Algonquin, they've, they've done studies on futures and futuristic things that you can go on. Now, as if I was doing this as, a, as, a, as, a, as an independent journalist or something like that, I would definitely get the views of the yin and the yang in there. But it's not the only component. Now, like I said, as Bob Matter said about that position on the submarine, that's something that they had group consensus on. You know, there are a few things that we can agree on that are general forecasts for the you know the next century and they're readily available on the web but what the one thing that's nice about you know search engines and the world wide web that we have never had is this instantaneous access to these forecasts and you know about group dynamics i remember reading a while back in a book by isaac asimov called the foundation trilogy about something called the science of psychohistory and he described a lot of the you know, emphasis back in the 50s on what group behavior could do, but it had to be large sample sizes and things like that. Plus the study of history and the trends that it does also helps out a lot. So what I'm simply saying is that when you're looking at the science of forecasting, sometimes uh, data analysis, uh, forecasting with trends, common sense and a knowledge of history is probably more weighted than it would be within the uh, than, than it is within the group dynamics, because if you put them all together, you're generally going to get a good uh, forecast. As a matter of fact, um, the best predictions about the uh, about the war in uh, Ukraine, I mean, it comes from a, a, a site, I'm trying to remember this, but it, it's a study of war and what they do with it. And they've given some good predictions about the outcome and what's going to happen 
with it. Although we don't know what a dictator will do, we know what motivates him because we've seen it in the past. And uh, we can almost accurately predict how he's going to react. The thing is, we want to try to influence that behavior by, you know, not doing so. In a nutshell, if you're going to forecast or you want to see what the knowledge is out there, you can practically do so by, uh, you know, just Googling what you're looking into and interested in. And usually you can find views real quick on, um, you know, on, on what goes on. Most people, when they go on the webs, usually stick to about eight different websites for their information and stuff. And they don't do what I call uh, free basing the web, which means you go out and you really look. Sometimes another search engine like Bing can be a little bit different than you, Yahoo is also a little different. And then you can also go to Baidu out of China, which is another one. And a lot of these things will give you that information, that forecasting thing you're looking for. I guess I'm not just saying this GN's uh, methodology works. It does to us as a part of a good forecasting model. Anyway, I hope I've made my point. Uh, Charlie, you're next. So go ahead. All right. Let's thank GN for a a nice presentation and a time to put in on the PowerPoint, covering a variety of things. I'll be eclectic as usual. Uh, I gave a lecture on predicting the, the, what's gonna happen in the 21st century. You can go to the lecture library. The, I gave the lecture on December 29th, 2012. That was 10 years ago. You can see how accurate I was. We used to have on occasion the World Futurist Society at the college. Maybe we'll try and have them back again. Uh, when uh, part of my life, I served as a reference li in the reference library for Wall Street. And this is a library entirely to predict the future for the business community. The entire library existed entirely for predicting what would happen with the economy. Uh, and that just goes to show you that a librarian like me is the best predictor of what's gonna happen in the world. Anyhow, next of all, she talked a lot about traits, T-R-A-I-T-S, traits. That's a branch called social psychology. And they try to do personality inventories. And you fill out questionnaires and then they come up with what is your personality and they give various terms that they use. It's used a lot in opinion research. Uh, the only thing I'll say about traits is that if you have a specific trait such as charit charitable, you are consistent. People don't vary. Once they develop a personality, they are consistent. Like if you're a jerk, you're always a jerk. Um, the <laughs> traits also was used by Scientology, the cult. They would do a personality inventory. And then they said, if you join us, we'll help you develop into a good person. They would identify all your bad traits. And they said, we'll help you out. Um, people are not born with traits, I'm sorry. Uh, that just doesn't happen. Uh, no traits have been identified, uh, nor is this birth trauma stuff have any validity. Um, the, uh, the only thing you could say that you're born with is maybe uh, the basic structure, intellectual structure for using language uh, or, or autonomic responses, instincts. Uh, that's about it. Uh, you don't have any anything beyond that. This is this is getting into a field called phrenology. Maybe you see in the 19th century they would draw a picture of a brain and say this is the part for this, and that that's just a lot of a lot of hooey. It doesn't go there. Uh, the other thing I found interesting is fox and hedgehog. I will tell you this: they were discovered that why people are creative. And they were foxes in the sense that they were always learning. And there was like a case, like one guy, he was always learning so that he even knew how many stairs there were. He lived on the second floor 
he counted the number of stairs. And adjunct to me is someone who knows only one thing. That's kind of like someone who's stupid. I only know one thing. <laughs> Anyhow, and last of all, uh, the this notion that I should listen to some Trump crackpots on TV <laughs> is going to help me learn and grow. That's the wildest thing I've ever heard. Anyhow, thank you, Jihad. Get working on the next one. Thank you. In summary, once a schmuck, always a schmuck, right, Charlie? Yeah. I got to listen to Trump crackpots. <laughs> All right, Jihad. Ah, I'm going to learn something. You will, Charlie. <laughs> All right. All right, Jihad. Sorry about that. You get the last <laughs> word and, uh, and, and sum it up and let you in the college, okay? I got to have balance. <laughs> Balance intelligence with stupidity. Well, you might learn something, Charlie. That's yin yang. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes you might learn something from the stupid guys and what they're. Oh thinking. yeah. Yeah. All right, Jan, <laughs> go ahead. Well, um, thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to present, and I appreciate all your comments. Um, if I want to make something specific comments, um, I would say that um, our media for uh, national news, um, you can hear more than one voices, right? Um, Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians um, express uh, some different perspectives. But in international news, um, it's very difficult to hear different views, whether it's um, liberal media or conservative media. I don't watch Fox News, but I have heard other people make comment um, saying that there are some, uh, com com some, some um, I haven't heard, but I uh, would not affirm or deny if that's something that I don't know for sure. Um, it's possible that someone from Fox News may have presented more than one perspectives on international new news. That's, uh, I will not deny things when I don't know about it. I'll keep an open mind to it. But um, coming back, uh, the reason that I don't really put a lot of time on news um, for two reasons. Uh, one is um, I have limited time, so I have to decide uh, how to use my time more effectively. Um, even if I know every aspect of um, current affairs, um, does it make me a better person? Do I uh, change the landscape of the politics? My uh, answer is no. So because I don't feel I have a lot of time to investigate every aspect and to evaluate every aspect of news. And uh, even if I do, it doesn't make me either a better person or make me have the power to change the political landscape of the nation or, or of the world. Knowing my limitation, then I make a conscious decision of not spending my, my time that way. I only listen to 15, about 15 minutes news in the morning, CBS news, just kind of to know what's going on. If there's something particularly piqued by interest, then I might Google and try to get different perspectives, but knowing my limitation of time and the power I have to make any changes, I think I've made a wise decision not to um, spend my time that way. It, I mean, if if um, other people have, like you have your own, um, time management, uh, you think you can change the world, um, 
that's uh, that's like personal choice, right? But I think the most important thing, like philosophers in the East and West have said is to know yourself. If you don't know yourself and you are making comment about national, international uh, news happening, uh, you are just being not very realistic um, about um, the power that you, you have. So the more I reflect, the more I think it's important to know what's important to me and, uh, and uh, my limitation and a strength and to use my um, strengths to do things that, that are meaningful to me and to make any possible changes uh, in my life and in my work. And one of the things is that I, like I put um, some speeches, one of the reasons is that it helped me to organize my thought. And then I share with people who are interested. Um, in some ways, maybe I make a little bit difference. Um, I hope I make a good difference. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Perhaps, Gian, you could engage in a more noble occupation, like wondering how the Cubs are going to do, or maybe your uh, Dallas sports team next year might do, and maybe enjoy a baseball game or two now and then, you know? No, you know, I'm a teacher, so I do influence uh, a few students, and uh, um, I enjoy my work. I not only teach Mandarin, I also... Uh, sometimes share my wisdom with my students. Well, that's good. And sometimes even <laughs> reading those books of wisdom can help out. I well, if you have your students again. call me up, I'll oh, share my yeah. wisdom. Oh, oh, oh where, do, where do you teach the Mandarin? I live in Dallas. I teach in uh, um, Alcon. Um, it's a uh, IB school. I teach high school, um, uh, IB school, and I uh, appreciate the IB curriculum that we promote international minus and uh, compassion um, to make the world a better place for all. What did you say, IB school? Yeah, what's an IB school? International Baccalaureate. Yes. Oh. Okay, oh, okay, I didn't realize you were in, in Dallas. Right. I assumed you were okay, here. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm mm -hmm. going to, uh, okay, Margaret, you got one more, uh, one more. Oh. I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to tell Ellen that uh, there are several there are several IB schools in in Chicago, and in particular, my son went to one is Lincoln Park High School. They have an IB program as well as a double honors program and uh, other kinds of uh, programs there, and it's uh, just an incredible program. And I'm so pleased that he was able to do that. They teach philosophy and how do you know what you know on a high school level which I'm totally jealous about because I didn't learn that until I was 48 or something. Anyway, so um, it, it, it's, in, it's, in, it's in high schools all over the world because it was designed for diplomats, children, so that when they went from one setting to another, their kids would fit into where the other kids of the same age were in the same grade in, in the high schools that they were going to. So um, that was what it was designed for, but the standards are so high and so really uh, challenging to the kids and the kinds of things that they, the kinds of things that they take are, are real, they're all AP classes and it's all very, it's all very intensive and very good for the kids. I know I've had some experience uh, teaching speech uh, in some of those AP programs through the China, some of the schools that are from China, they had one in Barrington where, I was working for about eight weeks with kids on a, at, a, at about a middle school age level in teaching some, you know, basic speech pro, pro programs and stuff. And man, I'll tell you, they are some of the, some of those AP programs. Some of those kids are, are, are sometimes even smarter than the adults when it comes to some of the things. Anyway, at this point. <laughs> I this taught point, in the inner city and I assure you, none of my students were going to be international diplomats. Well, anyway, Charlie, let's, uh, let's I, cut it off here and, uh, 
We'll say, we'll adjourn. When, We're formally I adjourned. To make comments. Yeah, if you cut it off. But um, the that's interesting with the that Lincoln Park. That's the best one of the best schools in Chicago, I think. And so it sounds like that'd be a wonder if there's a textbook or pro a curriculum that it would be interesting to learn about how they all right how we've, their curriculum is. Okay, now we've we've obviously uh gone a little bit off schedule. So at this point, I'm going to formally adjourn the College of Complexes. I'll keep the Zoom call open. So thank you, Gian, for tonight, and we'll see you all next week. Sure. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you.